wait. You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to TV Guidance Counselor. I am your TV Guidance Counselor, Ken Reed, the on hiatus stand-up comedian and Boston-based miserable person. Uh, I don't know why I said that. Uh, who each and every week since Valentine's Day 2014 has welcomed a guest to this show. We looked at an old issue of TV Guide magazine and we discussed the difficult viewing choices of our collective past. And this week is no exception. My guest is comedian, writer, just all around good, fascinating dude, Blaine Capel. Uh, Blaine and I have been trying to get this done for a long time, and I'm so glad that we were able to get him on the show. I had a great, great time talking to him. If you are unfamiliar with Blaine, get familiar with him. Follow him on all the social media. I will put links up all over the TV Guidance Counselor stuff, because he is just, uh, I don't want to say joke machine, because that's sort of offensive in the stand-up comedian American community, uh, but he just, he cranks them out, and they are always funny. Uh, and just a, just an awesome dude. Uh, Lucha Vavum, just if you don't know Blaine, no Blaine. Uh, if you have any other guests you'd like me to have on the show, you can email me at tvguidanceconcert at gmail.com or ken at icanread.com and I will do my best to get them on the show. Uh, let me know how you're doing. Let me know how you're holding up. Things are still kind of tough out there, uh, but I appreciate you guys listening and I hope you're doing well. And thank you again to everybody who's giving to the Patreon. Uh, let me know if you want to shout out by name. I don't like to name and shame people unless they ask me to. Uh, that makes it sound like you're a weird kink. It, no, just I would I would mention you by thank you by name if you would like that. Uh, but that's a different story. So in the meantime, please sit back, relax and enjoy this week's episode of TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, Blaine Kapach. TV is my friend and it has been always there for me in time of me. Blaine Kapach, how are you? I'm fine, Ken. How are you? I'm doing uh, all right given the state of the world. Uh, <laughs> ah, it's not so sunny here. It was actually very cloudy. I don't know if you were on Twitter. Oh, it rained. Yeah, and people were psyched it rained. about it. it. Huge news. Let's take a look at that clip. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, let's throw in the clip now. I remember a few years ago I was out, and there was like a rainstorm that wasn't really that bad, and one show I had got canceled, and <laughs> then, which I was like, come on. And then I went outside the next day, though, and it looked like the apocalypse because like there were downed like palm trees everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, they're not equipped for this. I like uh, when it rains out here, it washes all the uh, pollution and grime off everything. So you get a day or a day and a half of everything looking really gorgeous. <laughs> it's like uh, the taxi driver nice. cleansing rain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> rain is cleansing. <laughs> Depends on the rain, I guess. That's true. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, uh, LA people cannot drive in the rain, but they can barely drive in the sun. Yeah, but so, that's true in Boston as well. Uh, I, th I think it's true in, uh, on, on Earth here. Yeah. People are just j bad drivers in general. People should not, not you and me. We're great. We're amazing. I mean, I'm basically a stunt driver, but uh, we people should not probably be in cars, most of the people that are in cars. <laughs> no, no, no. I uh, I don't enjoy driving, I, and I haven't really in the last like 18 months because I haven't had to, uh, uh -huh. but I, when I lived in the UK... It was like a year of not driving, and then I came back, and I just remember feeling so sad that I had to drive. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I wouldn't get rid of my car, but I was like, Ugh. "Yeah, you gotta have your car." Yeah, I, I like driving. It's my uh, I like cars and driving. Are you so, a car guy? I am. Do you have like uh, a classic car? You know, I have an old squareback. I have a '74 Volkswagen. Oh, Last nice. of the squarebacks. Oh, nice! Yeah, it's gorgeous. Uh, which. Oddly brings us right into this issue, which is in August 24th to the 30th, 1974. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you could have been driving that car off the showroom new and watched what was in this week of television. And drove it right back in to get fixed. <laughs> Why that car? Was that like one that you coveted as a kid? Uh, we had two of them when I was a kid. They were weird squarebacks. My parents, my dad would have a Cadillac and then we would have a weird Volkswagen for the family car. And then uh, we had these, uh, uh, the first one was a green one and it got rear-ended. I was in it for that one. And the gold one, I went, almost went through the windshield when I was going to school in it. My dad was taking me to school and there was some ice and a guy went through a stop sign. Jeez. Great. So he was used to driving the Cadillac, which is virtually indestructible. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was, they were huge. 
Oh yeah, my uncle was a big like get a new Cadillac every month guy, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it was it was they it, they called them boats for good reason. <laughs> Too big. Yes. So this was in southeast Pennsylvania, like you were sort of on the border of of. Um, this, I was in Dallas Town, Pennsylvania, which is in York, which is kind of near Lancaster Amish country and. Uh, York was the first capital of the United States. That's the stupid trivia. Well, everyone fact. knows it as the birthplace of rock supergroup Live. Uh, they used to be called. They used to be called Public Affection, <laughs> and people would call them Pubic Infection. That was the joke. I mean, I or, imagine it was difficult to grow up in a place where you would constantly hear the dolphins cry. <laughs> <laughs> there was, you know, there was a. It was a big metal town. There was a guy I worked with. I worked at the record shop, the the listening booth at the York Mall. And there was a guy that sold guitars named Chris in the back. And he was in this metal band called Cry Tough, T-U-F-F. And they had a rivalry with another York band called Killer Hit. And they used to, and people would get tattoos and stuff like a broken heart would cry for course. Cry Tough. And they were getting fights and shit. It was great. So it was basically a heavy metal parking lot. Like, Boy, whoa, that's what was. I'm picturing. Uh, it was. The, uh, the band Extreme, Boston's own Extreme. Mm -hmm. um, the... Nunu Betancourt and uh, one of, no, not Nunu Betancourt, the drummer, I think, had like a music instruction store in this mall in Medford, Mass called More Than Chords. Oh, wow. And Sully That's Erna, what music is, man. It's more than chords. It's just more than chords, man. Sully Erna of Godsmack, the former Alice in Chains cover band and somewhat argue current Alice in Chains cover band, <laughs> uh, taught drums there as well. So it was just a the super group. Godsmack? Yes, Godsmick. <laughs> My God, we've had some bad metal bands from Massachusetts. Uh, I also didn't know that Striper, the heavenly metal band, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, had they were tied to Cape Cod because all of them live there now. Were they? I, I don't know what their connection was, but a friend of mine went to buy a guitar from like the Wan Ads, and he shows up, and it's the dude from Striper, and <laughs> he's selling him his Striper guitar. He's like, "Oh yeah, man, we all live in the Cape." You know, I bet they were, I bet maybe they were New York or Jersey based or something. Here's, here's me speculating without Googling. Uh, uh, this is what it was like before Google. Where's Striper from? I yeah. think they were probably from New York or Jersey. They uh, started making some money and they're very conservative. So they, they moved north, north, north. And then they got, they invested wisely and ended up on the Cape. All right. That, that makes me so, makes me feel a lot better about where they ended up in life. Because for some reason I felt like it was a failure. But now the way you've described it, it sounds like they moved up in the world. Uh, I think their costumes look really bad close up. You can see tape and stuff. Oh yeah, I mean they they their whole thing was was dressing like spandex bees basically, was, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and loving God. Yeah, and they, Isaiah three. I forget what the what the Bible quote was, and everything was all shocking and stuff. It's really weird. Yeah, Nirvana put paid to that shit. Yeah. God damn it. Um. So, cause you're you've been playing guitar and been music a music guy forever, like way before you did comedy. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I no, I started I started comedy in '85. Okay. And I love I've always loved music. I didn't start playing until '90. Okay. I just played constantly. So. So you were the five years in. I'm doing comedy, but I want to be a musician person. Oh, okay. like some of us. <laughs> just yeah, just uh, just just uh, keep doing it till the end of your life. <laughs> That's kind of how it works. Yes, yes. And then you'll eventually uh, stop, whether you want to or not. Um, so this issue here, this, I, I sort of thrust this issue upon you because I had it and it was sort of within the age range that people generally pick. Uh, you're on the younger side with this issue, but you said you do remember most of the things in here. Yes. This is full on 70s, like right from the cover. We have Susan Blakely on the cover and three very hip 1974 ensembles, pantsuit ensembles, really. Uh, and it says from Texas to TV commercials and a hundred thousand dollars a year. And I don't know if I've, I've heard the name before, but I couldn't tell you what I know her from with Susie Blakely. Yeah. She, yeah, she was, uh, uh one of those ubiquitous faces in the seventies. Have you, uh, uh, one thing I, that stands out to me is 20 cents. Yes. <laughs> yes. 20 cents, which almost seems like why, why isn't it just free? Yeah. So, so, but, but then you see $100,000 a year on TV guide. That's a lot of money. If TV guides 20 cents. Yeah. That's, I don't know what the math is there, but that's a lot of TV guides. Like if they paid her in TV guides, which occasionally people would do uh, cause of inflation, uh, that's a whole lot of them. And man, I used to get paid at comedy clubs, uh, total TV guides under the, under the table, man. You're like, dude, you want Coke or TV guides? Uh, you taking get, the guides. get a suitcase and taking the guides, get better resale. Uh, and then speaking of drugs on the back cover is a camel 
Falls ad mm-hmm. that features weirdly uh, a uh, a nod to the. Um, was it Charlie Atlas? Uh, Charles Atlas ads from the old comics. <laughs> yeah, like the, the, he's that, that man's the worst nuisance on the beach. There's a lot of cigarette ads in this oh, yes. 1974 TV guide. It's it was uh, uh, startling. Every, even up till the 2000s, there's a lot of cigarette ads because I think it was the only place you could advertise cigarettes. Apparently, uh, and the most disturbing thing about this camel ad though is it's people at a beach and they're in an ice cream truck. But People out of meat. Everybody out of meat. has matching towels. <laughs> Sorry, I blew it. There's rock lobsters everywhere. Um, I had Fred Schneider on, and I'll never hear the word Gorn again without hearing it in his accent. Because he Gorn. Oh, I love the Gorn. And he said that him and <laughs> him and Keith Pearson, he goes, We went to the they went to some sci-fi museum. He's like, bottle of baby Gorn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like great. Follow baby Gorn. Your baby Gorn. Um oh, Jesus. But this ice cream truck Gorgeous. appears to sell cigarettes and ice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't around in 74 so i don't know if that was a thing well ba- c- cigarettes were very unstable back in the 70s and you had to keep them cool or they would explode in your face and then it would look you'd look like a harold lloyd clip <laughs> this is high test cigarettes we this, this stuff is really volatile yeah they still had lead in them back then they yeah. made them with real sugar too cigarettes were different everything was better back <laughs> when i was, when I was a kid <laughs> It was a danger. You could have blown your face clear off. Uh, there's also a really cool article in here, at least to me, about cable and how they, they couldn't put cable in New York, mm-hmm. which was a has a cool piece of commissioned art, which is like a tapeworm cable that is just like conquered New York. But it, it's a thing that New York didn't get cable till like 1989. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. Because it was so old, the infrastructure, they just couldn't. There was no way to do it, uh, which is infamously MTV, which was shot in New York, wasn't in New York till like five years in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it was uh, uh, it was easier not to to than to. I mean, I imagine people in New York probably were out doing New York things like, uh, you know, gang fights or, um, you know, being in the Warriors or something like that instead of watching <laughs> television. So it probably wasn't a big deal, but still. <laughs> Well, you know, I also remember when uh, my neighbor had cable, but I didn't. We we didn't, and it was a uh, and it was a matter of not only did you have to have the money for it; it was very expensive. There were, weren't any packages or anything, so it was kind of a prestige thing. You also had to have it worked under your house. That was oh, a yeah. big hassle. And my dad was like, "Yeah, you fuck that." <laughs> well, you tell me those people was like, "I don't want people in my house." Yeah, and what you know, but my dad, my dad had a barber shop in the front of our house. Oh, okay. So eventually, we had we got cable. He sort of leaned into it a little bit, but tax right. But for a while, it was like I would have to sneak over to my friend's house to watch Ultraman and Batman and stuff like that. In like, I would see a lot of anime. Yeah, we. It's funny that we there was like two uh, markets that got most of the anime, and one was not counting Hawaii, which got a ton of it, I'm but sure. like. The Pacific Northwest and then weirdly Boston. Like we got Star Blazers yeah. and Simba and we got like all this stuff for that some That was Philadelphia, yeah. That just, I don't know why we got it here. We don't have a large Japanese population. <laughs> well, we got, uh, we got Star Blazers, which I got, which I found by accident. And then I would sit down with a, a cassette recorder and I would record it and then I would transcribe it because I wanted to write a novelization of it. <laughs> have uh, you finished it yet? No, I, you know, I called, I remember I called Sandy Frank, the guy that produced (laughs) it. I don't even, I must've been, you know, like 14 or something. And I was like, I wanted to write the novelization of Star Blazers. And I had no idea about the space cruise Yamato, any, any, aside from the words in the credits. And, uh, but I called him up and I was like, Hey, can I talk to you? When you would have to cold call people. And I looked up his number and I called his office and he puts me through. And I, I remember him. I was ta- asking him, hey, well, who do I talk to about perhaps? And I had like a thing and, and you could hear him on the phone go, oh, it's a kid. I'll yeah. be cool. And he was very cool. He, he said, here's you want to call this company. They're in Kudan Kita, Japan. And Good he, luck. Like, walk me through the address. Yeah. And, and he gave me all the numbers and I called the numbers and they worked. So hats off to Sandy Frank. He was cool to a kid. Did the Japanese people be like, we, I have no idea what you're talking about. They did about. not speak. <laughs> they put somebody on the phone that spoke a little English, and then he did not have the same kind of like, oh, I'm talking to a kid. I'll be cool to him. 
<laughs> like I we we have things to do. We're working here, kids. Uh, yeah. People may know Sandy Frank from uh, at least ten MST3K movies. Uh, yeah, the and Battle of the yeah. Planets. Yeah, Battle of the Planets, which. Uh, he uh, produced in conjunction with Ted Turner, specifically for mm-hmm. TBS, I think. Uh, well, they would, they would get like a movie and they would cut it into chunks and pat it out really bad. And then what Casey Kasem was one of the voices on oh, Battle yeah. of the Planets. So they would just get pat out a movie for you know, 26, 28 hours. I love the Voltron story, which you probably know, where they bought mm-hmm. this Voltron cartoon and they get the tapes and it's not the one they bought. <laughs> They bought the one with cars, not lions, <laughs> but they were like, oh, this one's pretty good. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and they just used that one. Yeah. It's, it's lean into the, turn into the skid. Yes. There's a, uh, have you ever seen the howling Two? your sister's a werewolf? No, I did not. Uh, it is maybe Sybil Danning's finest role. All right. Um, Christopher Lee is in it and they shot it in like Bulgaria, some like weird sure. Eastern European country that had just had a fall of a government. And they rented what they thought were werewolf costumes from Hollywood that got shipped to the set and they turned out to all be (laughs) ape costumes. And they're like, well, these were shipped all the way here. Like we got to use them. Yeah. So Christopher (laughs) Lee goes, I know what we'll do. Cause he was playing a werewolf expert. He goes, I'll add a line about how at some point werewolves go through a monkey phase. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which he says in the movie and because it's him saying it you're like oh, that sounds legit yeah okay but when you start to think you're like this is ridiculous and they're wow. literally like slightly modified monkey costumes in a werewolf movie uh, how would why why wouldn't somebody say christopher no <clears throat> i mean i guess they were like well that's the best idea we've heard <laughs> i would you know what i would say i would say hey a werewolf must have bitten some monkeys <laughs> We got to rewrite the script. <laughs> this yeah. Is, that would be interesting. Cause would people even notice like if a monkey turned into a werewolf, it would get, it would uh, only go for your face and genitals on the full moon. <laughs> yes. I once tried to write a thing about where people and they were animals that would bite other animals. And then they'd turn into like confused naked people. <laughs> what was the, uh, 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 my kid asked me if a zombie, uh, if you bite a zombie, if it turns in back into a person. Oh, that would probably not. They'd probably just be mad. Yeah, I think you would just infect yourself. I used to try to do a bit on stage that never worked about how vampires were just zombies people wanted to fuck. (laughs) Um, (laughs) They they are, really. I mean, really, it's like, no, but this one's pretty good looking. I mean, you know what I mean? (laughs) Because it's really not that different. Uh, They both eat humans in in certain capacity. Uh, So you have siblings? I have two older brothers. So were they making like Boomers. all the TV decisions, I imagine, being older? No. You know what? They were out of the house. By, I was very young. Uh, they were 16 and 14 when I was born. I was oh, okay. Late. So they weren't around. Yeah. Yeah. Love child. And they, uh, but they, so they were gone. I had their records and all their books and magazines and stuff, but they were gone. And my parents were, like I said, my dad had a barbershop. There was a TV on in the barbershop. So I was always, always had TV. Would you like go sit in the barbershop and watch TV there? Or did you have like, I would, Okay, I would watch the gong show with my dad in the afternoons. That was fun. <laughs> I did a show with the unknown comic. Oh really? Murray Langston? Murray Langston's still around. This is like two years it ago. Is. <laughs> yeah. He was, he played my friend Suzanne's dad played in a jazz band with him. Oh, okay. yeah. So anyway, he was a nice guy. I was, I he was a very like, nice guy. Very we, funny. We talked about uh, night shift and uh, not night shift, uh, night patrol. And he was, uh, he was very surprised that I'd seen it. I'm like, it's a funny movie. Uh, and Jimmy JJ Walker was also on who was a different story. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, he's a weird guy. Uh, yeah. I'm, yeah. I met him. I did two shows with him and he does that thing where he's like, is you act totally clean? You gotta be squeaky clean. Not, not, and I'm like, sure. And then he goes up and is just filthy. Filthy. Yeah. Yeah. And super weirdly racist. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, 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 he, it's well, he wasn't he dating Ann Coulter for a while. Was he? I th- yeah, I think they're uh, they were a couple on and off. I'd believe that. Yeah, I, he's. Yeah. And he, his, but he was friends. He was friends with Dave, and I, yeah. I guess you know, different when he was younger. Yeah, I've seen like the old stand-up footage of him. He's amazing. Like, he's yeah, he was very funny, really good. And yeah, he hired like all those guys to write jokes for him. And uh, but his opener now is. And he did this in both cities I was with him. It was like, what's up with these potholes? I was driving here. I fell in a pothole and there was a family from Cambodia living in it. Yeah. And then it goes on for another two minutes. <laughs> with <laughs> act outs and accents. <laughs> and it's... Uh, it was probably 
that was probably uh, some uh, some A stuff back in seventy five. Yeah, I mean Letterman definitely wrote that for him. Uh, so Saturday night, let's dive in. What'd you do at eight o'clock? Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me scroll down here. Well, uh, Saturday, I was uh, well. I think uh, starting with Saturday night is kind of missing an opportunity for where I would live, which was Saturday morning. Yes, let's jump into Saturday morning. Seventy. I was a little upset though that it's did, that it did not start well. It had weird stuff in the beginning. There was always farm report type shit in the, in the beginning, like AG USA breeding authorities explain how computers are lures to find ideal mates for a herd of cows. There's always farm <laughs> reports in the beginning, and then uh, uh, and then it gradually comes into focus with Davy and Goliath and some Christian stuff, and then uh, uh, it goes into I would be watching the Adams Family. I'd watch some uh, Bugs Bunny first if I was in that city. There is a thing on at seven a.m. That sounds like a sketch from Wonder Shows in, and it's a show called For Kids Only, mm-hmm. and it says Watergate in the world is the topic discussed <laughs> by panelists from the, Win- only. <laughs> the Winchester Recreation Department's summer program. <laughs> yeah, it would be it would be just death. It was hot death on camera kids at seven talk in the morning. Watergate. Yeah, and there weren't like itchy kid suits. <laughs> Inch High Private Eye was great. That was. Was that Don Adams or something? Oh yeah, it was him basically being uh, Maxwell Smart. As it, it was, it was uh, Hanna Barbera's recycled Scooby Doo formula that they had mm-hmm. seven hundred different shows about, like Funky Phantom and all those. Yeah, and it was yeah, Scooby Doo and the Ghost Chasers with an inch high private eye instead of a instead of a dog. <laughs> yeah, they just it, uh, it, it was amazing. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. A movie. I just was looking at the Speed Buggy joined Scooby and the gang in a deserted town. That's them running out of. <laughs> Ideas and time crossover. Yeah, it was always when you went to space or formed a band in a cartoon, they were mm-hmm. out of ideas. Yeah, I just saw a clip of uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kids, which I remember watching, and I thought it was cool. Rock band, and they had my initials BC. It was on the their their fighter plane. What a but, uh, weird uh, pun to build the show around. <laughs> yeah, just like they don't call Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kids, whatever. Kid, kids, and, that works. <laughs> And they had a, he had a, a ring. He was a secret agent, and he had a ring where he would talk to this giant computer called Mister Socrates. And they would go into this weird room with lights and bow down to this computer like Landru in Star Trek. But uh, then they would go, you know, solve some dumb crime. I talked to Paul Bad. Dini because I had this. Uh, like theory that I'm like, these were not the shows they pitched. Like they must've had licenses and shows and then just started modular slapping stuff together till somebody bought something. And he's like, that is exactly what happened. Like he, he goes like he worked for filmation. He's like, Lou Sharmer would call it and be like, ah, I sold the show. And it'd be like, what was it? The Brady kids or the one about the monsters? Yeah. <laughs> just be like, That's one <laughs> the show. Brady now. monsters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, all right, perfect. Perfect. Uh, yeah, 74 is kind of a slightly weak Saturday morning uh, year. Yeah, it was not the best. My favorite Marsh, Martians was bad with Ray Walson. I remember there was an episode of that where they had to fuse two two of them together and it freaked me out. <laughs> that like is it, I had a, I had a Yeah, I had a weird like uh, 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 existential freak out. Sigmund and the Sea Monsters was garbage. Lassie's Rescue Rangers, that was garbage. Electric Company, I would watch at 5.30 after uh, uh, Mr. Rogers. And I would just hope for Spider-Man. <laughs> Yeah, it was good. That was uh, all we got as kids who liked comics. You had a two-minute segment of live-action Spider-Man on Electric Company. Yeah. I had a, I had a, I remember uh, watching these with my kid, and I was like, oh, I had a crush on Winnie when I was a kid. <laughs> it just hit you now. It had been like a repressed yeah, I was like, memory. Oh, I remember, I remember this. <laughs> my kid was fascinated with uh, Love of Chair. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Weird soap opera, Love of Chair. Which is kind of a hip, weird, surreal, funny thing to have on a kid's show yeah. at that they time. They were doing good stuff back then, back in the 70s. Morgan Freeman thought so. <laughs> I uh, on that. Star Trek cartoon, I had another freak out when they uh, transformed into like underwater people. That was a lot of A lot of, a lot of weird... Bi- oh, here it is, Butch Cassidy at 1130. <laughs> It was only on for like for a few months. It was not a very long lived show, but I have a, an issue of the comic book as well. Oh, and it's but here's the thing: it's up against Mission Magic, which was the Rick Springfield as a magic magician musician cartoon. Do you believe you believe, believe in, in magic? magic? Mission is magic, and love will shine, shine through. through. Yeah, what a terrible that show! And it was horrible. It, they clearly wanted to do a Doug Henning show. And then they had Rick Springfield. 
We can't get Henning. I got this guy from Australia. He's a rock musician. That works. Because <laughs> it's so Henning. It's all rainbows and ma- like I. We missed a trick not working on cartoons in the 70s because that sounds like the easiest job. On yeah, Earth. and you don't have to animate anything. No, you just write whatever garbage and they're like, sounds good. Uh, the Jetsons is, uh, was al- I would always watch the Jetsons. Um, Fat Albert, a little, little uh, problematic now on every level. Yep. Oh, um, I love their Halloween episode, though. They're, it's like a classic uh, old man who hates kids things, and they try to win him over. And they're playing this prank on this old guy. I think he lives in a dump. And uh, <laughs> Fat Albert goes, hey, what, why are you picking on him? What do you ever do to you? And one of them goes, he got old. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's one of the meanest things. I'm like, well, a kid would say that. Uh, I used to try to do a joke about how uh, uh, they had that band and all their instruments were made out of junkyard stuff, except Rudy. Rudy had like a guitar and an amp. Yeah, and it's like, man, what a dick! Like, hey guys, <laughs> playing your garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Rubber bands and a broom. What the hell are yeah. you doing? <laughs> yeah, you got ripping your couch. I think we need to um, have a re a re. Uh, a reboot of that show from his point of view. <laughs> yeah, the Rudy show. <laughs> like, hey, uh, hey, guess you didn't go to prison for uh, the thing. <laughs> He's just a lawyer now. Yeah. So anyway, that's ba- yeah. It was kind of a disappointing year for the uh, for the Saturday morning thing. Maybe we should get out of it. Let's hop into the nighttime, where it's all family all the time. Well, I'm gonna kick it off. Oh, I'm gonna work my way into it with the Lucy show. Bing, 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 bing. This is the bing, second bing, Lucy series. Bing. Uh, yeah, the one starts with the weird marionettes at the beginning. The first terrifying Lucy series, I think. Yeah. Oh, hey, check it out. Look at this. I just looked at, saw this uh, uh, at six o'clock on Channel 22. Wacky world of Jonathan Winters with Bill Cosby, Latin singer Charo, and the Gold Diggers. I bet that's real entertaining. <laughs> I bet that's great. I've never Jonathan seen Jonathan Winters. Show. Yeah. Charo. I've never seen his variety show. It couldn't have been on that long. Yeah, I, I saw it. I saw it a few times. I mean, I Charo. All, I saw all this stuff. Was, Charo and Jonathan all. Winters, it's just a match made in heaven right there. Jonathan Winters would scare me sometimes because he was one of those comics that was a legit crazy person. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, sometimes yeah. he'd be doing, going off and you'd be like, all right, now I'm, I'm actually kind of scared now. <laughs> I, well, I never got scared when I was a kid. I always, was, I always thought he was just sort of kindly and funny. And then as I got older, I was like, oh, there's something wrong with him. Oh, yeah. So I had I had years of thinking he was just like the, the just a nice, sweet, you know, hey, we're doing oh, wacky we're, guy. <laughs> yeah, his old old lady characters and stuff. It's in, like, oh, he's troubled. In Mad, 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 Mad World, when he's just like destroying things and he's on a rampage. <laughs> you're like, yeah, no, I'm kind of scared now. <laughs> on that bike, riding yeah. that little bike, trying to, it's all bent. Oh, ah. good God. Uh, so, uh, uh. Well, all in the family, of course. I would watch with my uh, with my family. That was, you know, a, a great memory of mine. Watching all in the family with my folks. And that show kind uh, of passed me by, and that it 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 just didn't click with me when I was growing up because it se- it was just that it was too recent, sort of, but felt old. And I didn't really oh, come yeah, to yeah. appreciate that till till later. Like I love fifties and sixties stuff, but seventies stuff, I was like, eh. well, it was very. Uh, uh, it was just like a one set play, you know. And it was, uh, uh, if you didn't like the characters, you didn't want to watch it. But it was, it was, uh, uh, even when I was a kid, it was, people would, my parents would gasp sometimes and I'd laugh really hard. It was very well written. They got away with some, the other garbage. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> they got away with some stuff on that, that even now when I rewatch it, I'm like, no, this would have been shocking then. This isn't like, well, times were different. It was like, no, this is intentionally shocking at yeah. this point. You know, I've never I've never seen the episode where Edith dies, and I don't want don't really want to. It's brutal. Yeah, I don't want to. Watch I think it's actually an episode of Archie Bunker's Place. I think it's like the second series. Yeah. Oh, but the scene with the slipper, Jesus Christ, that is brutal. Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, no. I, the, the, I saw the Futurama dog scene. I don't need to see the <laughs> yeah. Edith dying. No, we all. And I know. love and I and I loved All in the Family. I saw most of it, and and, and just the. Uh, the thing that that's hard to explain to people is is when things started to spin off in the seventies, and it became a joke about spinoffs. But everything spun off of everything, and All in the Family had the Jeffersons, it had Maude. And you'd watch that stuff, and that would spin off other weird little shows that would survive for three or five episodes. I tried to figure out what show had the most spinoffs, and I think it's Happy Days. I think it is. 
Well, it, uh, let's pitch a series where Chuck dies in Korea because that's what happened. <laughs> yes. And, yeah. if you, and if you say if you say Chuck, uh, uh, Mrs. C will flip out. If you even say his name, she flips out. He he's presumed dead in Korea, but it's actually like a heart of darkness kind of thing. Yeah, he's still there. <laughs> he's Chuck's just a, fighting Chuck's that okay. war. He's fighting he's that just war. Just not home. Did you ever see the movie um, Dead of Night, or it was also called Death Dream? And um, Bob um, Clark made it, who did Christmas Story. Yeah. And it's a horror movie, but it's basically a retelling of The Monkey's Paw. And it's the most anti-Vietnam movie I've ever seen in my life. It's 1974. Basically, this guy, this people's kid dies in Vietnam. And they, you know, they tell him he dies. And then he just shows up at the door one day. <laughs> And they're like, what happened? And he ends up being this like zombie monster. And he's okay. the, the final okay. scene in the movie. And this is like a cheap exploitation movie. This scene is brutal. He gets his parents. He takes them to the cemetery. He digs his own grave and he's begging them to let him die. <laughs> oh, Jesus. That's good. <laughs> so some people went to a drive in to go see this. And I'm like, I don't know if you were prepared for this. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it, what, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the thing that, that, uh, that I remember about the, the TV guide, which was weird, is how they would choose what stuff to write up. Like they would have a list of what's playing and it would just be, you know, like, uh, 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 you know, chips. And it would just say 8, 8 a.m. And then underneath it, it would be the great American dream machine highlights yes. from the past dream machine shows include a uh, profile of rolling derby queen and Cavello who reflects on her good times and hard knocks on the ring. It's like why? Do, why are you not telling me what, who's on chips? Sometimes they get press releases, and sometimes they would get uh, preview tapes for some stuff. So that's where they would write about some things. But all the markets were different. So these are things I found out since doing the show, because uh, main TV guide was based out of Philly. And so often the Philly, New York ones would get more descriptions because they would get more press materials. Early. Okay, okay, yeah. But yeah. like the other regional ones, sometimes they were like, "We don't even know what's going to be on when we have to print this." <laughs> They just like, well, yes. Well, here's like, and here's a movie where they list the cast, like their cat, you know, like the character names, Dylan Hunt, John Saxon. I Isaiah, mean, Ted Cassidy. This is a good cast though. <laughs> that is a great cast. It's a Gene Roddenberry. Diana Moldauer. <laughs> Planet Earth. Angel Barrett. I think this was a failed pilot actually. Yes. Um, which you think he did twice trying to get this as a series uh, with the same script, which is weird. Uh, and this is summertime, so we're in August, so they're burning off stuff. They know they're they just going to try to recoup any money they possibly can. Yes. Uh, I would watch MASH, of course. Before it got super depressing, 74. Yeah, when it's still Frank was still there. Uh, here's the description. Once again, Frank is in high dudgeon, this time over a homosexual patient he thinks should be drummed out of the army. Hawkeye, Alan Alda, Trapper, Wayne Rogers, Frank, Larry Linville. Just that's, goes on like that for like nine more pages. That's a pretty extreme uh, topic for 1974. In 1974. Hey, you know what? When I was, uh, Bob Crane had a show before, of course, he was murdered. Yes. And, uh, uh, and I remember watching it with my parents. And uh, uh, there was an episode where Bob, one of Bob's friends was gay. And everybody kept saying gay and everybody's freaking out about it. And I was a kid. I was like, I remember asking my mom and dad, I was like, what does gay mean? Why are people so upset? And my mom just really quick, she goes, uh, it means happy. <laughs> and uh, like, why would his friends be mad at him for being happy? Why are they so freaked out about it? A more they, confusing and damaging answer than if she had just yeah, told you the truth. <laughs> exactly. They didn't let me watch soap, I think, because uh, of uh, Billy Crystal. But they just hated him. They didn't care that his character was gay. Yeah, I was like, didn't think he was that <laughs> good. They saw him at the funny. Catch a Rising Star thing. <laughs> no, he was Billy, actually very funny in that. He was funny in that. But I always say Billy Crystal's nobody's favorite stand up. <laughs> <laughs> There's nobody who's like, oh, I should have seen Crystal back in the day, man. He, oh, man. No one ever says that. Couldn't follow him. He was like, he was oh. like Brenner, but hip. I know you, you see him in things now, but back then, no one ever. Oh, you no oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's terrible. Crusher. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that show, those were like the quintessential. Like, you had to watch All in the Family and Mash. Like, almost every yeah. American watched those shows. Very true. It, it, was, uh, uh, it was kind of a communal experience. And this is back when there were only three big networks and then you would have like four or five little suborbital local stations that would have on competing stuff but i mean why would you watch it when nine o'clock there's mary tyler moore i'm watching mary tyler moore uh, i hear the music i hear the music now and i can i can smell the basement where we would watch this stuff and you know the rec room it's this, it's amazing the sense memory is amazing this particular episode is 
often considered the best episode of the Mary Tyler Moore show. This is Chuckles Bites the Dust. <laughs> oh, right, right. Which uh, it's not my favorite episode of this show, but like I recognize how it's a good like if you're only going to show someone one episode of the show, it's a good one to show them. Yeah. Uh, and it 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 is pretty unusual for 1974. Uh, for people who don't know that they're like Chuckles was their like kids show host on the TV station, and he dies, and everyone's making jokes about it the whole time. And Mary's very serious because she's like, "This is a real person. This is a man." Like how could? And then she starts laughing at his funeral. <laughs> and it's, it's yeah, uh, it's very funny. It, yeah, it's a, it was a a, a subtle <laughs> show which is kind of gone now. Yeah, but uh, but you know what? I'm sorry. I'm I'm just distracted here. I'm looking at this 106 piece socket and tool wrench and tool set <laughs> for 13.99. Everything you see there, over 200 thousand sold. Think about it. Oh my god. I, I mean, that's probably a high quality set. Perfect tool kit for home, auto, boat, shop, farm. Did you ever order anything out of magazines? Oh, I did. I was Columbia Record and Tape Club. I committed uh, a lot of mail fraud myself. Yeah. Oh, and you know what? I, I, I remember I sent away when I was a little kid, a little scrawny kid, I sent away for the Charles Atlas dynamic tension thing where you would just use your muscles against each other or whatever. Yeah. And uh, and I think like a year and a half or two years later, I get a, the envelope returned like out of business. <laughs> it just returned it. It was gone. I did that once because I used to get... I'd get a lot of Bronze Age, like, 70s comic books at, like, flea markets and stuff when I was a kid. And as a kid, you don't know these are, like, 10, 20 years old or whatever. So I sent away for that Frankenstein, like, the giant six-foot Frankenstein, Frankenstein for a dollar or whatever. And, uh, yeah, that got returned. And I'm like, oh, this probably went out of business 22 years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, I don't know if maybe they have some sort of auto pay on their account back in the <laughs> in the magazines. They probably yeah, it was it was check. It was all garbage. Oh yeah, yeah. There was no no one's <clears> like you know, it was the damnedest thing. I ordered it, a real car shows up. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. The sea monkeys had little crowns, and there was a little three ninety nine. Had little horses and pets. Well, there's that amazing in a castle. That episode of Get a Life where him and his dad get the submarine from the comic book. Have you ever seen that? Oh one? right, right. <laughs> uh, I, uh, oh, sorry, I'm just thinking of Bob and Ray. No, oh, Bob and Ray are so amazing. How uh, are they not? They never come up. You know what? They 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 come up when they have to. I guess I saw Bob and Ray. I went to a taping of Letterman back at the old Thirty Rock uh, when I was living back east, and uh, Bob and Ray were the guests. <laughs> so I got to see Bob and Ray. That was nice. They were and so Bobby Womack. Funny. Oh wow! That was that the Bob he filled in. It was yeah. Bobby Rome, Womack and Ray. <laughs> yeah, Bobby Womack and Ray. <laughs> they did these slow talkers, but Bobby Womack didn't know what the bit was. They did a special called Bob, Ray, Lorraine, Gilda, and um, Jane in the SNL slot once. And it was Bob and Ray and the three women from <laughs> SNL. And it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. And it's so much, weirdly, so much edgier and more surreal than SNL was <laughs> in 77. Oh, yeah. And it's like, it's just so good. Yeah, two guys with 30 years under their belts just riffing. Two old Boston guys just trying to make each other laugh. Yeah, there's Bob Newhart at 9.30. I'd watch Bob Newhart. And, and the music again, some of my favorite music. Lorenzo Music, I think, wrote that theme song. What What? What are the odds? <laughs> Was that his real being, last name? being named Lorenzo. <laughs> uh, and then Barnaby Jones, my mom would watch Barnaby Jones. His buddy Hackett is like an ancient... Detective. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, I could not stomach this ridiculous. show. Although Lee Merriweather is in this, one of the three cat yeah. women. Uh, and Mark Goddard from Lost in Space, who I, I had to almost break up a fight between him and Adam West once. What? Wait, wait huh? what? <laughs> I was in an abandoned J.C. Penny moderating a comic convention <laughs> panel. And I was interviewing Goddard, who is not super friendly. He's kind of an old Boston guy. He he moved to L.A. Uh, to become an actor because he stole a car, and his dad sent him out there to go uh, to go get sorted out by Chuck Connors, who they knew from the old neighborhood. 
<laughs> so that's get sorted out by Chuck Connors. Yep, we know him from the old neighborhood. He'll sort you out. But I guess Lost in Space. And, well, first of all, him and West were on a show called The Detectives together and didn't get along. Mm -hmm. And then Lost in Space and Batman sixty six were on opposite each other on different networks. And Goddard blames Batman sixty six for. Uh, he seemed to think Lost in Space in the first season was like a very serious sci fi show. <laughs> <laughs> Which oh, and wasn't. they made a camp on purpose to, yeah. to, to catch up with yes, Batman. Yes, that was his contention. And uh, he started complaining about it. And then Adam West from the other side of the room goes, I made it better. And I thought they were just <laughs> kidding, and but they weren't. It got like heated, uh, but uh, it, it wow. calmed down eventually. And wow. then also in this episode, Nick Nolte. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. As Paul. Yeah. Can you believe it? Paul? I, could, I can't see him as a Paul, but, you know, he was a better actor then. Uh, yeah, it's and then down here, Robert Young, Linda Day George, uh, just amazing. Just looking at the uh, uh, the cast list, you wouldn't be able to even bother with a cast list anymore. No, absolutely not. And they're also on it takes a thief. Julie Newmar is on. That's weird. Uh, there, there's dueling uh, cat women on at the same time. And this is a Boston edition. So there's a show on called Tonight from Harvard Square. <laughs> which is a special in 74 Harvard square was the uh, hitchhiking capital of the world at that point. Oh, wow. Uh, and this is Charles Lloyd, tenor saxophonist and flutist joins Bobby blue bland and the uh, Texas blues singer. 90 <laughs> minutes. That. that seems like it would be interesting. Yeah, that would be a good show actually. Uh, so that but, is, but you know what, but you know what, it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be as good as 1130, uh, the mystery movie. Ironside, the <laughs> pilot film for the TV series. Yes, yes. Uh, this, my mom would. My mom watched that all the time. I love that they call him literally quote the wheelchair detective. The wheelchair detective Raymond Burr is assigned to find the sniper who disabled him. Classy, well done. <laughs> Number one, I feel it like, says classy, well done, which sounds sarcastic. Uh, yeah, wow, it's unbelievable. I feel like they wouldn't assign you a case that you were directly involved in, first of all. Uh, second of all, wheelchair, the det wheelchair detective makes it sound like he is only doing wheelchair based cases. Yeah. I just, I, I'm investigating. I can walk. I just look, uh, I'm just solving cases involving wheelchairs. Well, it's the, uh, um, it's the SCTV, uh, thing where, um, uh, Joe Flaherty's character only has the oh, wheelchair yeah. for respect. He can walk or walk when he wants to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, on one o'clock on Saturday evening, by the way, Speakeasy, rock organist John Lord from Deep Purple and lead singers Ozzy Osbourne, Black Sabbath, and Ian Hunter, Mott the Hoople, 60 Minutes. That, that would be fantastic. Sounds pretty awesome, actually. And there's uh, Mike Oldfield, the, uh, the Electric Light Orchestra, and Manfred Mann on Don Kirshner's rock concert. And Bloodstone. Right. I'm just reading all this stuff. I'm sorry. I love it. No, no, it's fine. Those those shows for a lot of people was, again, this is pre-MTV. You know, you're not going to concerts when you're a kid or if you're in a more rural place a lot of bands probably aren't coming through this is where most people saw live sort of contemporary rock bands. yeah yeah exactly you know i'll tell and honestly i'll go i'll circle back uh, i saw some great m music on hee-haw that was oh, always really? uh, their secret weapon was they would have really great musicians and great performances on. what are some that you remember that uh, they would have, uh, you know, hey, there's Buck Owens and Roy Clark, two monster guitar players right there. And they would have uh, Charlie Pride. They would have uh, uh, Freddie Fender. They would have the Hager Twins. But there was always like really good, classy musicianship. I think it's Hee Haw. There's footage of, I think, Speedy West playing on there. And it's just like some he's playing just insane guitar stuff. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, they're all it's, it's, it's ma master musicians, all the country guys. <laughs> yeah. Just like and, this and is no unit. fuzz, just crazy stuff. Uh, so that is Saturday. What did you do on Sunday? On Sunday, I would get back from church. I'd have to go to church with my parents, and then I would uh, watch roller derby until uh, wait till your father gets home would come on. <laughs> or, uh, or I would also watch uh, uh, animals, animals, animals. Do you remember that? Yes. With Hal Linden. Yes. And uh, I used to complain about it because the story at the end was always a rip off of the story that was always on. My mom was like, why are you worried about that? <laughs> but Sunday night, uh, uh, sorry, I'm scrolling down here. Uh, do, 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 do. Wild Kingdom I would watch all the time. It's uh, Before shocking. anything came on at eight o'clock. It's shocking how many people I know were all about Wild Kingdom. <laughs> my my first five minutes, in my first five minutes on stage, I had a Wild Kingdom bet. <laughs> this one has, yeah. oh, sorry, what was the bet? Oh, no, no, I don't want to. Okay, you don't want to ruin it. 
Yeah, yeah, in case you come see me. <laughs> uh, this one is about electric eels, which when I was a kid, we went on a field trip to the New England Aquarium, and a guy was feeding the electric eel, and he got shocked and had a heart attack in front of us all. Oh, Jesus. What, uh, like went down hard? Yeah, he apparently lived, but uh, that's when I learned about electric eels, uh, which was, you know, uh, quite kill, a yeah. demonstration. <laughs> Do you Have you read... Um, uh, Ileana Douglas's book. No, <laughs> well, she's great though. She has a story in it that her and Martin Scorsese went to, um, uh, oh my God, uh, Marlon Brando's house in the Hollywood Hills. And he, <laughs> he had his pool filled with electric eels and was trying to power his home with it. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yeah, that sounds, that's not, that's totally Marlon. <laughs> Total Marlon move. Someone was like, because they don't work like that. But they, they were like, okay, Marlon, sure, we'll get them. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just put some wires in there and let, let them do their thing. And he's like, these idiots, they never tried this. This clearly will work. Uh, train at home, become a medical receptionist. Here's an ad. Here's another ad for Paul Mall Extra Milds. Yes. 46% less tar. They even know there's tar in them. And 46%, not that big of a number. Yeah, not that big of a deal. I'd like like 99% less tar. Uh, you know what? Sunday evening... Uh, is really bad in this particular <laughs> night. I would probably go downstairs and listen to music at this point. It's uh, the choices are the document, the a documentary, the corporation on CBS reports, uh, or evening at pops music. And it's uh, uh, Anna Maria Vera performs Hayden's concerto. In D- uh, we, uh, Jesus, I'm just gonna go downstairs. Boring. I have yeah. FX. So you guys have like finished basement wood paneling, beanbag yeah, chairs kind yeah, of thing like going. A, like a yeah, like a joke about that. <laughs> Bar? Like, I mean, I was born in 65, so in the 70s, I was, I was 5 to 15. So I was right in the middle of it. I lived in a small town in Pennsylvania on Main Street. My dad was the barber. My mom worked for the post office. It was ridiculous. It was like a, jo- it was a joke. Nobody believes me. How, were you like the kind of person who was like, as soon as I'm 18, I'm out of here? You know, I, I left the 22, I think, 22 or 23, I finally moved to Baltimore because I started Baltimore – in comedy in Baltimore when I was 20 and instantly was just on the road. See, Baltimore, I was I was a huge John Waters fan. So the first time I went to Baltimore was when I was in abandoned high school and I was like, this isn't like John Waters. <laughs> uh, no, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah. I, I loved it there. It was great. I loved living there. I've, I would see John Waters all the time. He would go to, he drove a Re- Plymouth Reliant K car. <laughs> it was black and he would uh, go to this supermarket and he would get out of the car and he would have uh, sunglasses on and his hat and he'd pull his hat down and look around and they'd walk in really fast because <laughs> he was probably the most famous person in Baltimore at the time oh yeah yeah well he did a, a lecture at, at the Comedy Factory outlet right after Divine died it was great I would see him at the Club Charles all the time he was there was a, a theater there the uh, Charles Theater on Charles Street a lot of Charles going on <laughs> and uh, he did a thing at the very beginning hi it's me John Waters you can't smoke in here and he's got a cigarette <laughs> Ooh, that's good. But you can't smoke during the movie. Don't do it. Oh, God. It was just terrific. He's, in in hindsight, he's one of the first stand-ups I ever saw because he would spend all summer on P-Town and he'd come into Boston a couple times every summer and show, like, polyester or something and do a and a and I would go and he, he basically was doing stand-up. Yeah, he's one of those guys who's not a comedian but who's funnier than most comedians. Right, right. And just a, And just... A, a, a great guy it's, uh, and he's old i'm it's, it's a shame yeah i don't want to i don't want to bum you out the uh, uh uh he's got a christmas mix john waters christmas it's a great christmas mix. it's amazing it's fat daddy and santa was uh, a black yeah. man and uh, it's tiny tim's on it christmas at kmart there's some great uh songs on that uh so let's move on to monday and hope that it's better pickings than sunday was yeah so yeah sunday can blow me <laughs> who's on who's, oh johnny warner argent or on uh, uh, Don Kirshner. Captain Kangaroo, I would watch a lot. Wouldn't be on the air today. No. Kind of a weird show. Very weird. And and Just, kids would be very bored, I think. Yeah, it was something to have on in the background. It was like the Today Show for kids. Yeah. You know, Good Morning America. It's on the background. It makes me feel comfortable. That's when I get ready for school in the morning. I just put it on there. <laughs> Yeah, there was a whole different uh, schedule of TV in the daytime. And like I said, my dad had was always in the barbershop. So I was always watching Mike Douglas and uh, uh, Dinah Shore and all those weird stuff on in the afternoon. Merv Griffin was always on, uh, 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 like Gong Show and stuff like that. But the, uh, Dark Shadows, 
was on Mary Hartman. Mary Hartman was on. So I would see all that stuff in the background. And your dad wasn't like, this isn't for you. Don't watch this. They were pretty no, hands off. No, <laughs> no, he didn't care. It was just, you know, it was all TV wasn't bad yet. <laughs> oh my God. Hold on. The Columbia record and tape club. We have to pick out our eight tracks. Yeah. What are you getting? Uh, well, I'm just going to take the left stack. Okay. I mean, that's there's a pretty good stack. There's Jim Croce. I'll do my Jim Croce bit. If you want me to <laughs> spooky tooth. Uh, uh, I remember when I got, uh, 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 I joined, the, the first thing I got was the cassette for Get Happy by Elvis Costello and the Attractions. And then I would try to, I try to get my money's worth. I got Sandinista by The Clash. Was, <laughs> Ooh, no. More is not always better. Yeah, it was an important, expensive lesson for What's me. What's the best, maybe the weird kid version of career opportunities and then somebody got murdered? Maybe think, Charlie uh, don't uh, surf. Rebel, Rebel don't. Uh, Rebel Waltz and uh, Magnificent Seven. Oh yeah, Magnificent Seven is is almost worth yeah. the whole record. And the other it. two and a half sides of the album <laughs> of dub. Yeah, forget it. <laughs> there, uh, yeah, there's a lot of country here. We got the Carpenters share. Uh, there's some stuff I've never heard of, like Redbone, Wovaka, and Ferrante and Teacher. Oh, Ferrante and Teicher. Yeah, they were uh, uh, Franny and Teicher. I, I reference them and nobody knows who they are, so maybe <laughs> I'll stop. Uh, Cher, Halfbreed, that's uh, problematic. Yes. Uh, Donna Fargo, George Jones. My dad was a, 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 the hee-haw thing. There was like a sort of a cleaner adult kind of country music back then that my dad was really into. There's uh, Roy Clark, The Entertainer. Uh, Percy Faith. And you got, of course, Vicki Lawrence. <laughs> I've, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have some Percy Faith. On my iPod. I like Percy Faith. There's also Buddy Rich here, which all only just makes me think of that Buddy Rich uh, just yelling at tape. His, yeah. <laughs> yelling at his band. What which a dick. was one of the very first, like, uh, like trader tapes I remember getting. It was like that and, like, the Reds Bar tape. Right, right, right. <laughs> Uh, Chris Christopherson. Anyway, let's, let's, mo let's move on. Yeah. Well, did we, did we do Monday night? We have not done or, Monday night yet. Yeah, Sorry, this sca to... this scanned weirdly uh, sideways on Monday night. Well, I see Dick Van Dyke at nine thirty. I'll watch that. Yes. And I would always I would always watch the Carson monologue with my dad. My, he would let me sit up and watch the Carson monologue with me, and I knew it was time to go to bed after. You know, not when I was single digits. But. Is this still when Carson was like two hours long? <laughs> no, it was an hour and a half when I was a kid. I remember when it went to an hour, I was bummed. That is 50% less show. That would be very disappointing as a kid. Uh, and Medical Center is on. And the weirdest thing about this show, which is a drama, is uh, this is Chad Everett's show. The guest star is Dom DeLuise. Ah, <laughs> uh, Dom is great. <laughs> which I'm like, dun, dun, dun. He's, I don't think I've ever seen him in like a TV drama. <laughs> Did you see uh, The End? Oh, I love The End. Ah, it's, he's great in The End. It's the, probably the best movie you did with Burt Reynolds. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, before they descended into uh, uh, self parody. Yeah. Uh, second best was, suicide movie guys. behind Harold and Maude. <laughs> I would say the rescuers down under, but let's move on. <laughs> uh, news your review. Here we are in the morning. I, I don't. I, uh, uh, I'm go, I'm going to Tuesday. Let's do Tuesday. Because there's there's Maude. Oh, Room Two Twenty Two, which is one of the very first TV themes I remember hearing in my life. And that was a great show with uh, most of the main cast were black, which was really unusual. Yeah, uh, it was a dramedy kind of before that was coined, like single cam shot on film comedy. Only two seasons, but it, it, it kind of holds up. I've rewatched that show and really liked it. It's uh, I remember maybe it's it's because of that, but I was always shocked when people made a big deal out of like black people on shows or whatever is going on because I was, when I was a little kid, there were shows like uh, uh, room 222 and Maude and stuff like that all in the family where there was, you know, at least they were addressing smarter things or, or larger, more consequential things. Yeah. I feel like we regressed for a while. Like even Cosby's first Bill Cosby show that shot on film show that was, where he was the gym teacher. It was kind of like curve your enthusiasm. Right. Like that was 72 or something. Um, yeah. It I was mean, weird. Even, even like, uh, the white shadow shows right. like that were, you know, were written with, a with a real earth foot in, in, in society, I guess. Well, I think Reagan ruined everything. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, happy Days I watched religiously. Yeah. I was a huge Happy Days fan. I had the, the 45 and the B-side was Cruising with the Fonz, an instrumental. 
Uh, and I, I loved Happy Days so much. So, Still mad at Scott Bayo for burning down uh, Arnold, the, the fucking asshole. Yeah, and he did it on purpose. Uh, yeah. Don Moston couldn't have been a nicer guy. Uh, oh, great. He did Mad TV. I wrote a sketch uh, oh, really? with Lauren Dombrowski called uh, Love Titanic. And he did it? Yeah, he was uh, on the Love Titanic. He uh, he has like a nine-piece swing band now. That's what he mm-hmm. mostly does. And, he played uh, Fatellos when they're not killing Robert Blake's wife. <laughs> what camera am I in here? Yeah. Ooh. Uh, we recorded like we were – he was doing a show down at like Foxwoods or something. And so I went down and recorded. We were like in a corner and one of the – and every two minutes – Oh my God, Ralph Murph, call my wife. <laughs> and he'd be like, all right, <laughs> he'd just do it. But I was like, it must be like this nonstop. Uh, there's you know, I, I, pronounce, I pronounce it like Rafe Finest. It's Rafe Mafe. Rafe Mafe. The, uh, 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 there would be, at 8.30, it would be Laverne and Shirley, of course. Yep. You got to do yet, the whole night. Uh, the, uh, uh, and then at nine o'clock on Tuesday, where I was from, it would be uh, Three's Company. That the, would be the choice where I was from. So the, I'm just going off memory. The horniest show on television, uh, Three's Company. Um, there's an amazing show on opposite Happy Days that has one of the best titles I've ever seen. And I haven't read anything about the description of the show, but it's called Man Builds, Man Destroys. <laughs> and it's listed under the genre Report. <laughs> In the past four centuries, more than 350 species of animals have become extinct. What may result, warns this report, is an ecological imbalance, overpopulation, and starvation among remaining wildlife. Um, they're not wrong. Oh, and then and right below that, the Great American Dream Machine. <laughs> this week's collage of past Dream Machine segments include pie throwing lessons from the Albert Brooks School for Comedians. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and also some overpopulation and starvation among remaining wildlife. We're all going to die, but this is funny. And yeah, there's Sa- a pie fight. Satan's starvation school for pie girls. fight. <laughs> <laughs> uh school for, uh yeah you couldn't do this stuff oh and there's robert townsend yeah wow that's early early this is a good night i think tuesday is the pick of the week thus far i'm liking it there's banachek my mom would watch banachek which was george papard i think that was it was a uh, uh uh george papard yes yeah not, who would introduce himself to people saying i'm george papard i'm not a nice man <laughs> Uh, there's a great uh, uh, I hate to talk about I don't want not hate but there's a great Banachek thing on the Simpsons Manachek it's, it just nails it where it's just like he, every scene is, is him just doing banal stuff <laughs> pressing an elevator button and looking at the elevator numbers going up and well, taking forever for every shot the um, the Adam West look well pilot that Conan and Smigel yeah. did where there's constantly people misidentifying which cop he was. And he's like, no, that was Branishek. That was George Papard. I was Brannigan or whatever he was. Uh, yeah. Love it. Also, uh, 1974 swimming pool, 795 bucks, completely erected. Budget terms arranged. Yes. Yeah, so that is uh, above ground though. Uh, which uh, we, then fuck it. Yeah. We used to, we used to call those the white trash pools. Uh, even though I didn't have one. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to get in there because I didn't want to get cut. I do kind of want to uh, take this call-out burst that just says completely erected and just put that on a T-shirt, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. there's The it's the shit writes itself. <laughs> Did you know anyone that had a pool growing up? I uh, I, I knew some above ground and, and, and some in grounds. Oh, wow. So you had some rich friends. Yeah. <laughs> more, more above grounds than in grounds. <laughs> I like I said, what... I was... Small in Pennsylvania where you could get like an in-ground pool for 10 bucks. Yeah. I mean, seven ninety five. that's pretty ritzy. That should come with a house. It's like, oh, my God. It's, it's, it's this hose water. It's all filled with hose water. Uh, 9.30, I can't remember what was on. Uh, I would be like something like Simon and Simon would be, you'd be coming up on some sort of detective show at 9.30 or 10. This is a weird show. It's GE Theater. And this special stars Maureen Stapleton and Paul Sorvino and an encore of Tell me where it hurts. <laughs> yeah, an encore. Get back out of here. Get back on my television and do tell me where it hurts again. Tell me where it hurts. After yeah, 26 wait. years of marriage, Connie found herself someone new in her life, herself. <laughs> yeah, about fucking time. Uh, that seems oh, there's not, yeah. There's police story, there's Marcus Welby. My mom would watch Marcus Welby. She loved cop shows? She would just watch. She liked uh, uh, like uh, soothing procedurals and investigation shows. She liked murder. She wrote. She liked uh, Father Dowling mysteries. She watched. There was an Ellery Queen show that was on that she was fond of. I think she was, you know, 
some things don't change. It was um, always like older, older gentlemen, I would think. Were you watching luchador stuff when you were growing up? Because we used to get that in Boston. And I know you're obviously a fan of those things. Uh, you know what? No, we would get black and white wrestling occasionally that was all, you know, pre, uh, pre-American pre wrestling. And then uh, I watched more roller derby when I was a kid than wrestling. And then and wrestling kind of happened in school. I graduated from high school in 83. So I was right ahead of kind of wrestling and and like Beastie Boys type shit. I was right ahead of it. Right. So, I, uh, which is fortunate. I think. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that roller derby, although came back in the last decade with like roller derby girls doing kind of live stuff, they've never really tried to put that on TV again. Nah. And it was a staple though for like a decade and a half. And yeah, it was then- great. It's in, fun to watch. I mean, I, I was a roller derby announcer here for 10 years or 15 years. It, it's and perfect it was, television. It's, yeah, it's blast. But, but it's it's hard to ensure. Yeah, that makes That's sense. The, it's hard to ensure. Do you remember Rock and Roller Games from 1990 when they tried to bring it back? And yes. <laughs> they had an yes. alligator pit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything had to be like some sort of a uh, battle of the network stars thing. Yeah, it was like an American Gladiators kind of ripoff, but then they'd have like Ozzy Osbourne play in the middle of the show. <laughs> it was weird. I'll take that. Uh, Wednesday, what are you doing? Wednesday. Uh, oh, there's some Gilligan's Island. My son hasn't seen Gilligan's Island yet. Is that by design? No, I think it's. Uh, he just hasn't. He watches The Simpsons for hours and hours every day. Do you have a I've list com- of things that you're like? I need to show him these things. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, shows I would like him to see, but I just want him to watch what he wants to watch now. He hates commercials because kids aren't conditioned for commercials right now. Which is amazing uh, because our brains are filled. Like, we could probably rattle off 200 jingles right now with zero research. (laughs) Completely. Oh, I'm just looking at this. Wait till your father gets home, the cartoon that spun off of Love American Style, one of the first... TV theme songs I remember hearing. Jonathan Winters provides the voice of Spry Maud Frickett, swinging restaurateur. It was basically uh, the way that the Flintstones was the honeymooners, where your father gets home was all in the family, I guess would be yes. how I would explain it. Uh, it was uh, I'm, watching the, I'm watching the Hudson Brothers, because they were great. I love the Hudson Brothers. Actually funny and smart and good for kids. They had the show uh, Razzle Dazzle. You remember that? No. They were Saturday like a country morning. act? No, it was well. Mark Hudson, I think, is married to uh, Kate Hudson. Okay, or was, uh, uh, but it it was three brothers, and they were musical, like kind of like you know hanging out dudes, and they would they were zany, and they had like a Saturday morning zany sh- live sketch show, and uh, they would do live sketches and have guys in gorilla suits and shit, and you know fast motion, and sing rock songs. <laughs> Uh, but it was it was very entertaining and actually very smart. Kind of the way like Rat and Enough's Enough are like smart, good bands, but they look like that. Yes. You know what I mean? Does that yeah. make sense? I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, I would watch the Hudson Brothers. They were always funny. This one has Gary Owens in it and a spoof of 1940s South of the Border musical numbers. <laughs> Finally. Oh, and Rod Hole and Emu are in this. Rod Hole and Emu were one of those acts that were – they were ubiquitous in the 70s where it was a guy from Australia. Do you know this guy? Uh, yes, I've seen footage of this. Yeah, And he would, uh, uh, he, would, he would have an emu with him. It was a puppet, which was just his arm dressed like an emu. And he would get into fights with the emu. It would try to grab people. And then he'd get in a fight and just punch himself in the face. It was like a guy who Hilarious. wanted, I want to be a ventriloquist, but I don't want to put the work in. It's, it was insanely physical and like super slapsticky. And violent, like he would yeah. like just end up on Johnny Carson's lap. But uh, uh, he died when he went onto his wet roof in a rainstorm to adjust his TV antenna. He slipped and fell? Slipped and fell. Rod Hall. Oh, I man. learned that in Viz Magazine, the only magazine that matters. <laughs> do you have a subscription to UK Viz Magazine? I do have a subscription to UK Viz Magazine. I've had one for 25 years. The only magazine I have is subscription. One of the original uh, artists in Viz Magazine, the Scottish cartoonist, can read all oh, right <laughs> he did a lot of the monsters and he did the, yeah the uh, uh monster uh what's it called the uh uh something monsters i have the hardback I'm, yeah I'm it, just some crazy uh amazing weird art that reminded me of like uh basil worldwide weirdies yes that's yeah. it yes very basil wolverton yes exactly exactly uh which is a high compliment uh anything else on wednesday 
Uh, Wednesday, my mom would watch Canon, <laughs> which was great. He was so, it was a guy who was too fat to like chase people. So everything kind of had to happen around him. William Conrad. And, yeah. There was one episode where he was sitting in that big green LTD and he's staking out a house. Uh, Ruth's Chris staking out a house. <laughs> uh, and then the guy who he's spying on looks out the door like suspiciously and he can't duck because he's too fat <laughs> so he holds up a newspaper so the guy can't see him totally and not it suspicious. and it worked it worked i always liked when he would show up on like donnie and marie and things and would do yeah. like song and dance stuff he was he was a good he was a good actor he was yeah. just like kind of cast as the as the well he's the literally the in jake and the fat man yeah like that's just i don't know i always wonder how that offer went like we got a role for you, and this is great. It's a starring role. It's a title role. Uh, you know, it's a crime drama. Again, all right, I'm into it, and it's called Jake and the Fat Man. <laughs> hey, uh, guess who, hey, guess who you play? <laughs> no. <laughs> all right, uh, I'll do it. So there's uh, there's Kojak. My my mom would watch Kojak, which the Beastie Boys still refer to uh, a parking spot right out front as a Kojak. Yeah, spot. that's a Mad Magazine joke. I call it Kojak <laughs> parking to to this day. So do I. Yeah, Kojak, Kojak barking right in front of the relax the back. <laughs> okay, so we're on. So, sorry, I, I pressed the wrong oh, button. No problem. I Wednesday back evening up. I was here. looking at Romper Room. Yeah, Kojak's on at 10. And then there's a, th a thing called Festival Films. It says a short slapstick, a slapstick short about an elderly misanthrope who travels around the nursing home in a motorized wheelchair. This work won a judge's award from filmmaker Fred Weissman. Jesus. It better have. <laughs> it, well, it has. Uh, there's the worldwide special with the world's worst driver. Yes, a woman who failed her driving test forty times. An English woman. Yeah, talks with David Frost. Remember when he interviewed the Richard Nixon, yes. <laughs> the president who resigned in disgrace? Now he's interviewing a woman who failed her driving test forty times. A man jumps. TV. Off. TV is a bitch. It really is. A man jumps off New York City's Flatiron Building into a twelve-inch deep pool of water. Yeah. He better. And the world's <laughs> smallest man. This is yeah. This this is just ridiculous. I just saw the the word six million here and reminded me that six million dollar man would be on on Sunday nights. That would that would. Uh, I was in the Bionics Action Club what when was I was that? in the fourth grade. Just, just the thing I sent club? away for that actually showed up. And it was just like, did you get like a card and a newsletter or something? Yeah, I got like a, a certificate and that I signed with cursive <laughs> and uh and I got some stuff I forget what the stuff was like some sort of card that's gone and uh oh and I got some bionic limbs nice yeah I never installed them cuz I would have to amputate my own limbs yeah and you really need a friend to do that for you your parents put you together yeah uh, just go to the piercing pagoda they'll do it at <laughs> piercing pagoda you don't want that to get infected uh thursday what uh st d jumps out at you thursday uh, well, here's what's on in this one is uh, uh, the Waltons, which I would never watch. Nope. Mac Davis, which I who I loved, and I played D and D with Ken Daly, and Mac Davis and Bernadette Peters played him his parents in a, a TV movie. Really? Yeah, it was. He said Mac Davis was really cool, and so was Bernadette. This whole lineup's pretty great. Andy Griffith and Jerry Stiller and Ann Muir are on it. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, oh, and then they have the list of the songs in the medley. Yes, which is I mean, it, this goes back to like too much information for these people oh but on thursday uh i would watch welcome back cotter that was my thing and i think uh uh, uh uh it was really funny and it was like i was in fifth grade i would just watch it all the time and kids had shirts with like you know barbarino on, Sit them on it <laughs> yeah uh, uh, uh but the uh 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 i remember going back when youtube kind of came around going oh now i can watch all these shows i used to love when i was a kid and i watched Welcome back, Cotter. It's so fucking bad. It's, it's unwatchably awful. bad. It is one of the worst. Like, I can't even get through an episode. Horrible production values, badly written, lazily written. Mm -hmm. It was a lot like the cars in the 70s. Just <laughs> whatever works. Does it, does it turn on? Good. Good for you. Unsafe at any speed. That was. Yeah, they, <laughs> they really didn't care. No. It was all Reliant K cars and Chevettes back then. And uh, 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 Chico and the Man was especially bad. I yeah. remember watching that and being angry at how bad it was. Although I've rewatched Starsky and Hutch <clears throat> and it's really great. Oh, yeah. Really yeah, great. I love Starsky and Hutch too. It was great. It's intentionally funny. There's like good action scenes. There's yeah. uh, that amazing episode with the Satanists. <laughs> yeah, and actual and and chemistry between the in the cast. Yeah, 
It was fun. It was a, a, a fun show. And that's a show that I that was always kind of a punchline. But when I rewatched it, I'm like, no, this one's good. <laughs> oh, yeah. I did a linoleum uh, uh, woodcut or linoleum cut in art class uh, to make a Starsky and Hutch print where I wrote it backwards and made oh, it. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, it said Starsky and Hutch. You put that on the back of a jacket? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I should. <laughs> I got to go back to my high school. They probably still have it. Probably still have it. It's in a glass case. Uh, uh, hey, I'm looking here at later on Thursday is Just for Laughs, uh, Ernie, Madge, and Artie, a tale about middle-aged newlyweds, Clarice Leachman, and Dick Van Patten. That must be great. They're very funny. Underrated. I imagine this is probably a, a sort of a banner they put over unsold pilots in the summertime. Yeah. Uh, so oh, right. So this was probably a, a show that never went. Uh, but that sounds like it would have been a pretty fun show. Uh, yeah, it would have been a blast. I saw Clarice Leachman at the Real Inn out in uh, uh, Malibu. It's was like, she doing I, oh, singing like, or what was she doing? No, she was just eating. I'm like, don't oh. say anything. Don't look at this. <laughs> and then she died. Not at the Immediately because you didn't say anything? Like a, like a month later. Okay. It's like, ah, oh, that was my chance. You know who else I saw out there? Tony Dow. Oh. From Leave it to Beaver. Is he working? And he, no, he's eating, but he looks younger than he did on TV. I 50s. believe that. He looked like a 40-year-old man on that show. Yeah, like permanently 40. Uh, Kung Fu I never got into. A little, little heady for me when I was a kid. Also, uh, Ironside again. Kung Fu's pretty unwatchable now. Uh, aside from the fact that you're just like, this would have been b- better with Bruce Lee. Um it uh, it, it's just so slow and bad. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It's uh, it was a thing you just had to ha- had to get into. Some people were into it. This Ironside has uh, Desi Arnaz is in it, but also. Oh, uh, Ironside! What are you doing? <laughs> oh, hey, Ironside! Uh, the most specific impression ever. Um, this has L. Q. Jones in it, who was kind of like a cowboy actor, but he directed the Boy and His Dog movie. Oh really? Yeah, he directed one movie. Wow, that's movie. weird. He he personally bought the rights from Harlan Ellison because he loved this book. He wasn't a director; he was just this cowboy actor. And he pitched it to Ellison, and for some reason, cantankerous, wow. miserable Harlan Ellison was like, "Yeah, you do it." And it's a pretty good adaptation. That was that's fantastic. I you know what? Uh, uh, you should you should get Patton Oswalt on the show. <laughs> Won't do it because because uh, Patton is a uh, Patton is a huge Ellison fan. I, I was going to say he's an LQ Jones fan. <laughs> no, but it, no, it's a, a fascinating uh, aside. I was living in San Francisco and Harlan Ellison, there's a, I forget what the name of the bookstore is. It's on Haight Street, of course. But uh, he sat in the window like a puppy in a cage with newspaper <laughs> at a table with a typewriter. And he would write a story as people watched. And then when he, he'd pull the, the paper out and he'd hand it to a guy who would photocopy it. And then he would scotch tape it to the window and you could read a story as you wrote it, <laughs> oh, it was it was fantastic it. it's like it's like a uh, hot donuts like it like yeah Krispy Kreme, <laughs> like hot story right off the press brand yeah, new oh my god know. he's writing it right in front of me oh man you get a dozen <laughs> they make the harlan ellison right at your table <laughs> it's amazing. i have no mouth and i must eat this is delicious <laughs> i got a i got a fresh copy of the glass tea <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's good glass tea <laughs> Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, streets of San Francisco. I remember watching that was one of the reasons that I was fascinated with San Francisco and moved there. Cause you're such a huge I, Carl I, Malden fan. Yeah. But it was like, it was cool action. And like Michael Douglas was like the young guy that could actually throw a punch. So it was, Oh, and there's a woman named Vera in the cast and Nick Nolte. My wife is named Vera and Nick, Nick Nolte again. <laughs> also in this episode, page to page Alan, uh, so, so you went from, you started doing comedy in Baltimore and then went to New York and then went to San Francisco? No, I went from, I was in Baltimore, then I moved to San Francisco in 90, 92. And I was there for three years and then I moved down here in 95. Pat and I got hired to write on the Mad TV pilot and then mm-hmm. that got picked up. It was a very fortunate lightning strike for us. What year But what year did you do Beat the Geeks? Beat the Geeks was, oh, Three oh four oh five something late? like that. Oh wow! Yeah, J- Jimmy Walker, Jimmy JJ Walker was a guest, so I concur with your <laughs> earlier yes. your earlier vibe on that. Yes, uh, fair enough. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. He's very cool. You know who was great on that? Uh, Peter Noon from Herman's Hermits was awesome. Oh, really? he's got amazing stories. That guy. Uh, he's fantastic. He's got a. Uh, you ever tell? You ever hear the story about when he was driving around L.A. with Elvis, and he no. like felt like he was basically kidnapped. 
<laughs> <laughs> like Elvis was like, hey man, we're going to parties. You come with us. And he was like, I, okay. And they were just driving around going to weird places. And Elvis had like a gun and it was just like, it's, it's just the most amazing story of like a terrifying night. I'm looking at Friday afternoon. I saw some Hollywood squares, which I watched religiously. Paul Williams, Elkie Summer, Ernest Borgnine, Annette Fabre, Doc Severinsen, Joan Rivers, Vincent Price, Karen Valentine, Charlie Weaver, insane. That is a Paul crazy. Williams was on everything. Yes. Yes. I met him on the the lot when I was working on at midnight. He was coming in to do Chris Hardwick's podcast. And I saw him walking by. I said, Are you Paul Williams? And he said, Yes. <laughs> I said, You died with your eyes open on Beretta. And it really, <laughs> really fucked me up. And he went, Oh, thanks. I had to fight to do that. They didn't want me to do that. And it was it could it couldn't be cooler. He, uh, Phantom of the Paradise is one of my favorite movies of all time. But I will forever be terrified of Paul Williams because of that film. <laughs> he was, yeah, he was a we- he was a weird guy. But I mean, he he mellowed into a, a he was always cool, but he mellowed into a cool old guy. That documentary about him from a few years back is amazing. Where yeah. he's just like, oh, I was a bad person in the seventies. <laughs> <laughs> he did uh, he did his first live show at Poptopia, which was a music festival in L.A. And uh, he did this show out at like this place out on Pico way out somewhere. And I went to it and he sang rainbow connection and people were openly sobbing. I believe it. I believe it. But then when he he did the whole, all the music from Bugsy Malone, they just left. (gasps) My favorite band, goat girl, goat girl, check them out. They're fantastic. On their first album, they close with uh, tomorrow from, uh, from Bugsy Malone. Fantastic. Scott, Scott Baio, uh, his finest work. Oh, God. More (laughs) Bayo. There's an amazing thing out called Hollywood in the Stars. So it says, cameras view, quote, monsters we've known and loved and some of the actors associated with them. This is like a whole, like, clip show of monsters. But it it leads with John Barrymore (laughs) and Lon Chaney Jr. And I was a sucker for those kind of shows growing up where just be, like, clips of old monster movies and really had no narrative or anything. (laughs) Right, right. Uh, uh, yeah, where they just kind of, uh, uh, they, whatever they had lying around, they just kind of made a crazy mess. Yeah. And you're just a kid. You're like, wow, stuff you don't see ever. <laughs> and your parents don't care. No. They're like it's black it's and white. It's fine. Uh, I'm looking at, uh, uh, Friday night. I'm looking at, we would always watch Sanford and son. Uh, uh, and I was never into the Brady bunch. It was always, I would prefer to watch Sanford and son. Yeah, that's not uh, get, a tough choice, those two shows. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I saw The Brady Bunch over and over and over. I just saw The Brady House. It's over in Toluca Lake, and yep. I figured, finally found it, and I drive over to see it every now and then. And it's weird because if you look around the side, it's up against one of the L.A. River causeways, one of those big concrete river things. So the backyard is kind of up against a concrete thing and a fence, and it's like, there's no big yard with trees in it or no. tiger's doghouse or a garage with cool dodges in it. Well, it's a, uh, it's, it's a bizarre uh, facade. Well, the weird thing is, so a couple of years ago, I went and I looked at that house and the old lady who lived there was like, if you'd look at the house, would just come out and start yelling at you. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I'm like, you're in the Brady house. But when she died, the family sold the house and HGTV bought it. And they did a reality show where all the living cast of the Brady Bunch went and made the interior of the house look like the Brady Bunch house. Because it oh, didn't. Wow. And they had to build basically an entire house behind the house because it just wouldn't fit in that house. Yeah. It's super tiny. It's, but it was, it's not, not, a, not tiny, but it's not a big house. Yeah. It's not the way that that was set up. But it was kind of interesting to see them like retrofit it. Uh, also, Bill Coe's on every night, and I'd be remiss if I did not. Bill Coe's on every night. I love oh, that man. show. That is still really funny. Bill Coe is a good one. Uh, 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 get Smart, too, was always on where I was. And I would watch, I would get a root beer out of my dad's soda machine in the barbershop, and I would watch Get Smart every night at 6.30. That sounds like heaven. Yeah, it was heaven. There was an episode of Get Smart that didn't have a laugh track. And I remember it was, it really stood out. I don't know why it didn't have a laugh track, but it was like uh, where he, this woman was, a femme fatale was going to kiss him with poison lipstick. And at the end, she kisses him and nothing happens. Why didn't you die? And he, he pulls, peels these things off and he goes, plastic lips. <laughs> but there was no laugh track. And so it was just plastic lips. 
hold for nothing. And every joke, would you believe? You know, all that stuff just hung there. It was bizarre how it hung there. I'm saying bizarre too much. It is funny, though. Like, people make fun of laugh tracks sometimes, but you realize how it you do miss it if it's not there in certain shows. Like it is yes. required in the structure of some shows. It's yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's an instrument if you can use it right. I've, you know, I've, I've written a few sketches where you just use the, use it as an instrument. It's, oh, you can put all sorts of jokes in the laugh track. Were you working on Mad TV when Bob Newhart hosted? No, I don't think so. I was on the first four seasons. Okay. That, there's a sketch in that that's one of the best things I've ever seen, and it's no, I didn't work on that. Uh, it's clearly <laughs> never, but it's it's weird though because it's it's I, I don't know if he wrote it, but it's it's just him talking to the camera, and he's okay. interviewing someone for a job at the no, he's firing someone at the post office, and the person he's firing is the audience, so it's just a one man you know like a classic oh, okay. Bobby Hart thing. Wow, uh, but it's so funny, and there's some some hacky jokes in it that even work because he's doing it because he's like no 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 I'm not. I'm not calling your dog a liar. Like, it's like that kind of stuff, but it's like Newhart sells it, yeah. man. You buy it. It's, uh, uh, yeah. You, I saw him walking through the Burbank airport once and I almost started crying. Yeah. I bet he gets that a lot. Yeah. Me crying at the airport? <laughs> yeah. You just, specifically, you, <laughs> is there anyone that you worked with later that, like, not that made you cry, but that you saw, like, watch a lot growing up that you're like, I can't believe I'm working with this person? Uh, yeah, well, I just did. A, I was just in uh, Austin for the Moon Tower Festival, hanging out with Bobcat and Dana Gould. Yeah, you know, I mean, those guys. When I was a young comic, uh, I was in. I remember I was in Montreal for the festival, and they had the opening of the Comedy Museum and the inaugural. I guess the first person to be inducted was George Burns, and he was there and came out and did like a thing. And when he came out, just people stood up and started crying. I just remember I was like, why? Because he was always there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I worked with, uh, I wrote a pilot for NBC with Peter Bergman from Firesign Theater. Oh, yeah. And like his, you know, those albums were very, very influential for me. And I wrote for Mad Magazine. It was like, I wish my parents were alive so I could call them and tell them I wrote for Mad Magazine. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it's uh, I've I've had fun. The first comedian I remember when I was four. I'm sorry if I'm boring you. No, no, no this is fascinating. Uh, it's not boring at all. Uh, when I was four, my parents and their friends went to see Red Skelton at the Longs Park Amphitheater in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I remember I couldn't see that well. We were in the back, sitting on the grass with all these other you know, hundreds of people, and he's way up in the distance. So I I couldn't see. So I just walked up and sat on the stage <laughs> with my you know, legs hanging off the stage. And uh, uh, he came over and like said something to me and I said something to him and he kind of tazzled my hair a little bit. And then he said something and everybody, and then, like, people laugh and then I said something and people laugh. And then I looked down and my mom is like, whoa, come over <laughs> to grab me because she didn't know where I was. She, they were panicking. I walked away to get on stage so I could see. Yeah, on your, on your uh, resume, it says open for Red Skelton. Yeah. You know, I was just, I just remember I was just looking at him going, I'm funnier than this fucking guy. <laughs> I Clemkey diddle hopper, way. My dad was like cleaning. He was moving a few years ago, and anytime my dad calls me, it's like just complaining, like no matter what it is. And he's like, ah, "I have a bunch of your craps here from cleaning," and I was like, "All right." And he's listening to things off. He goes, "And that uh, that Sid Caesar autograph." And I go, "What?" <laughs> He goes, yeah, when you were two, you made us go take you to meet Sid Caesar at some wow. dinner theater. And I was like, I don't. But apparently I knew he was playing some dinner theater in Framingham. And I made my parents take me and meet him. And I, I have this autograph. And he's like, all my love, Sid Caesar. Oh, wow. My dad was like really pissed off. <laughs> God damn it. He had to make you meet this comedy meet legend. Sid Caesar, God damn it. But I still have the autograph, which is which is kind of cool. I don't remember anything uh, else about the show. <laughs> Uh, I'm friends with Eric Idle. That's nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I met uh, Graham Chapman when he came through Baltimore and did a lecture. It was like just all that kind of stuff is very exciting. I got you know what? When, when I, I worked on the Martin Short show, his talk show. I love Martin Short. Syndicated thing. He's great. But the only guy that I didn't go near that was a guest was uh, Steve Martin. I was, I was afraid to meet Steve Martin. He's very serious, though. He's very serious, but he's, he was such a he, he was like a beetle to me, that guy. Yeah. As far as comedy goes, and I just I didn't want to I just didn't want to. I uh, Bonnie Hunt is one of my heroes, and when I had her on the show, she was talking about she's friends with Martin Short and Steve and Steve Martin. She's just oh, like yeah. yeah, Steve and Marty, and I'm just like what? 
<laughs> like it just sounds weird just How being like oh, those two guys uh yeah and martin short i i such a, i am such a huge sctv fan and he was always the king of the grotesques on that show. He would do the weirdest yeah. Oh, yeah. stuff. And so it was always weird that he became probably, I mean, outside of Shit's Creek and stuff now, arguably he was probably the most mainstream successful SCTV alum. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, he had more time to get out of the grotesque because he was very, very young. He was always a little kid. True. Yeah, that is true. Um yeah, I absolutely love that. Um, where are we here? Oh, I was going to mention, who I'm, was it? Oh, I'm going to look at uh, The Odd Couple, because uh, that theme song is probably my favorite theme song. Oh, that is an excellent theme. Uh, yeah. Plus Jack Klugman, I'll watch in anything. Um, oh, that was what I was going to say. Uh, last year, I got to interview John Cleese for like three hours. <laughs> oh, wow. And the stories he had were like just unbelievable. Um, I, I asked him what the, what the most he ever laughed was. And he started laughing and he had forgotten this story. And it was him and Graham Chapman, but pre Monty Python, they were in Australia doing um, like the footlights or something. And they were at some park that was like a park where people would go, like preachers would go. And, you know, I forget what the, it's a famous park in Australia. And he's like, there was a guy who was preaching about the apocalypse and he had painted all these monsters like the beasts of the apocalypse on these big paintings but it was really windy so they kept falling down <laughs> and he'd be like and the great beast and he'd have to like run over and pick it up and pick it up and he was like i couldn't stop laughing and i fell over <laughs> laughing at this guy he's like i haven't thought of this in like 50 years and it was just like i'm like that's such a fun story um yeah uh midnight special is pretty good that night uh um, where's the midnight it's, special? It's uh, Friday evening at 1 a.m., but it's oh, an all-blues show with uh, Big Mama Thornton, who must have been old <laughs> yeah. on this show, even in 73. Uh, you got Joe Williams, Bobby Boo Bland again, Bessie Smith. <laughs> Bessie Smith. Uh, Paul Butterfield. Yeah, it's like... John these, Lee Hooker. These people, half of them had to be like almost 80 years old. Well, you know what the thing is, though. No, in in uh, in seventy four, they were they were only like fifty, fifties and sixties. Which they is... were su they were surprisingly young. I mean, I'm, I'm now that I'm old, I can see that that it's like like I remember in eighty eighty one eighty two. I don't know the exact year, but David Bowie was thirty five, <laughs> and I remember people were like. How how does he get out of bed without his legs breaking? <laughs> they couldn't believe how old he was, and yeah. then you know, I mean, he dies at sixty nine. Yeah. Nice, <laughs> but it but it's uh, people are are remarkably young, even though they seem old. Yeah, I thinking about it now when there was that like seventies revival of the fifties acts, like special in England with like Chuck Berry and and all those guys would go over to England. But yeah, they were probably like forty. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, do you see? Hey, uh, scan down from from that uh, to uh, four thirty in the morning. Channel five, the show. Good morning. Er, uh, at Good four. Morning. Yes. It, you, me, and Joe. Topic: homosexuality. <laughs> repeat. <laughs> It's a repeat. Oh, I've seen this one. Uh, it's you, me, and Joe. I mean, you, me, and Joe, it's redundant to say that's the topic. <laughs> uh, you, you and me for a while, then you and Joe for a while, you know, then me and Joe for a while. Yeah, then we repeat. Yeah, then lather, repeat. Lather, it also says lather and rinse. I don't know why. Uh, what's going on there? Uh, that is very, And the thing with two heads is on at 1.30. Oh, man. Ray Milland. <laughs> and Rosie and, uh, Greer. Uh, Rosie Greer. Oh, I can't believe that's a real movie. Uh, it really, it really is. Uh, 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 I know that that's pretty much rounding it out, but if you scan, scan down a little bit, uh, lemon menthol cigarettes, twist one yes. hundreds. Yes. Not only are they menthol, but they're also lemon. Not very popular. I don't think that was something that really. Is it Kent? Is that the lemon menthol Kent. cigarettes? Microtone filter, mild, smooth taste. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I don't. And my favorite thing about it is they've, I don't know if they commissioned this sculpture, but there's a sculpture, an aluminum sculpture, a sculpture here called Spiral, and it actually credits the artist in the ad. <laughs> Spiral aluminum structure by Steve Yuri. <laughs> is that in the twist thing? Yeah, it's like. Am I looking at the right cigarettes? Oh no, it's above. I'm sorry, the lemonade. Oh, the oh the can't ad. Yes. 
Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, spiral aluminum. Oh, Steve Urry. Oh Jesus. <laughs> so the cigarettes like commissioned an aluminum sculpture that they've credited in this ad. Look how smooth it is. It's it's metal that's kind of like liquid. <laughs> It's the T-1000 of cigarettes, uh, 20 year, <laughs> 25 years too early. Come with me if you want to die. <laughs> I have 40% 46% less tar. Uh, is there anything that you've been watching like over lockdown or over the last year? I know a lot of people have been kind of going back to comfort shows. Is there anything that you have that's like a comfort show? No, you know, well, you know, uh, like I said, my, my son is eight and he, my wife got me Disney plus for my birthday because we used to watch the Simpsons a lot when they were on it on Fox back in the day. Uh, but we sort of fell out and I watched the entire run of the Simpsons, all more episodes that I hadn't seen than I had seen. Uh, and my kid watches it in the background constantly. So I'm, and it's all the recent one. He doesn't like the early ones that I like. He only <laughs> likes the, the later ones. So I'm getting a crash course and they're really funny. I'm surprised at how, I mean, people are just, I guess they're just tired of it, but just, just they're full of jokes. Just nothing but jokes. Oh, yeah. I, the thing that freaked me out when I revisited The Simpsons later was obviously they update the show. So they have like cell phones and stuff now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but all the episodes I'm used to, they don't. And it because it's a cartoon and they don't change physically, it was like someone went back and CGI'd future technology into this yeah. old show. <laughs> like George Lucas got in there and yeah. just put his stuff in there but i'm like but of course they would have that obviously it's a it's for all intents it's a contemporary show um and it's still very funny uh they're trapped in time yes yes i don't know what uh sin they committed against uh fate to to cause that to happen but they must escape it's a groundhog day maybe that's the last episode where they get out of it <laughs> they're in purgatory just like the last of the dungeons and dragons cartoon yeah uh, they can finally <laughs> age like gasoline alley <laughs> they just crumble it's like in the hunger uh, <laughs> uh, it's me david bowie again i'm 36 now sweet relief uh, <laughs> <laughs> well thank you for doing this i'm so glad we finally got to do it this was uh oh, my pleasure what a what a blast thank I you really so much. i really enjoyed it There you go. That's Blaine and his idyllic Pennsylvania upbringing. Uh, what a great dude. Uh, love talking to him. So glad, as I said, that we got to do it. Uh, we have so many mutual friends. We attended the same wedding and, and said uh, a few things to each other, uh, but it was nice to actually get the uh, chance to sit down and have a, have a long conversation, uh, as I'm sure you would agree, because it was fun to listen to. Anyway, we'll be here next week, so I hope you will, too, for a brand new edition of TV Guidance Counselor. <laughs> They used to be called public affection <laughs> and people would call them pubic infection. That was the joke.